Okay, to preface this video, first of all, please excuse any background noise because I'm at my desk at school and I can't really do anything about that right now. Also to preface, um, I think that it's become of question as to why we're focusing on the things we're focusing on and why I'm placing so much emphasis on redoing assignments and sentence types. I think it needs to be clarified and emphasized that as we go through school, we come in contact with so many different teachers and so many different personalities and so many different approaches to teaching that the experience becomes very subjective and very unique every time. And I think that we've all had very negative experiences with at least one teacher in our life, um, maybe a teacher that we felt like targeted us or didn't like us or wanted to give us a bad grade for whatever reason. And I just want to, to remind students and clarify that whether you get an A or a B or, or, <laughs> or a C or a D or whatever, it doesn't make a difference in my life personally. It does not make a difference in in my job because success for, for each and every student as an individual is, is completely different from the next. The fact that a student is passing could be a critical improvement for certain students understandably so. While other students are concerned that they have the absolute best grade that they could they could possibly have and that everything is perfect and, and that they're doing absolutely everything they can to ensure that they get an A plus. But anyway, what matters to me is that each student is learning, period. That each student is improving from wherever they are. And for every student, that improvement, that beginning line, that starting point for them, that's going to be different for everyone. At the end of the day, those are the two things that matter. Student is learning, student is improving. The best way for you to show improvement, the best way for you to learn, is to redo the assignments that you did not do very well on. Can scores still change? Yes. Can the ultimate point value of an assignment change? Yes and scores will likely change before the nine weeks deadline for me is over in a reasonable, justified, fair way. That's not to say that a student's individual score will change. That's to say that the value of an assignment could likely change based on student achievement, reasonably and justifiably so. In class, I emphasize time and time again that it's critical that students keep their notes and use their notes to study and to complete their homework and or complete their assignments in class. Your note came from PowerPoints in class. Likely one of two, the basic grammar PowerPoint and the tone versus mood PowerPoint. The one that is most critical to you as a student is basic grammar. If you don't have these notes, if you have not utilized these notes, then it is very likely that you have not done well on your assignment. Having not done well on your assignments does not mean that you have lost hope of getting a good grade or passing. All I ask is that in a timely manner, you quickly, reasonably, clearly correct your assignment, make it better, improve from where you are, and patiently await feedback. And if it's still not on par, then guess what? You need to do it again because this is the foundation of your academic writing career. And all of that does not sound very nice and it doesn't sound very happy, but it's true. When you take the SAT or the PSAT, you will spend roughly 30 minutes on grammar alone. And those questions will be repeatedly checking your understanding of complete sentences and independent clauses over and over and over. When you move on to the 10th grade, the 11th grade, the 12th grade, and even college, you'll be graded on whether or not you can write a complete sentence, vary your sentence structure, and clearly organize an essay. It is all very basic. Emphasis will change as you go through your academic career. So here it's been tone a few times, tone and mood, theme, and going forward, that will evolve, even in just this class alone. And as we came into the ninth grade and approached our writing assignments, at the beginning, they often looked like this. So if I said five sentences minimum, write about what you did in your spare time, or write about something positively. So often, student writing would look like this. I love basketball. I spent most of my spare time playing basketball. 
The pandemic ended my basketball season early. I miss playing basketball with my teammates. I have the best time with them. There is nothing grammatically incorrect about that paragraph. That's an okay paragraph. And that's actually a wonderful paragraph for elementary school. I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm saying that the, I'm saying it because it's true. I had a recorder going as I typed that from start to finish. It took me less than three minutes. This type of paragraph is a good place to start as a single rough draft. I have my ideas on paper. My tone is clear. My intention is clear. My thoughts are clear. But let's say, now my teacher has said, vary your sentence structure to make your writing stronger because this is the writing of someone in elementary school or someone in middle school. But we're here in ninth grade English to improve our writing from wherever we are. We've done wonderful in the past. We've got a good foundation, but here we need to build another foundation and make our writing varied and stronger. And then your teacher wants you to change your sentence types again or vary your, your sentence types again, and then again, and then again. And then you ask why is this so important? When you're asked to vary your sentence structure and you're scored on doing so, then you immediately become more conscious of what you are writing and how you are saying what you are saying. It's no longer simple, 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 simple. It's how can I say this in an organized manner that still makes sense, but I have subordinate clauses and independent clauses joined together correctly. When you are asked to vary your sentence structure, you are asked to consciously and conscientiously place your commas in the correct places and identify independent clauses over and over and over again. And that leads you on a path to better identify independent clauses and subordinate clauses and where commas should go when you take your PSAT and your SAT. And we all know how critical those tests are when we're in high school. So to change this paragraph, my, my teacher has said, well, I need a simple sentence okay I love basketball exclamation point that's simple subject verb complement something that completes the idea I love something period exclamation point the end that's simple I spent most of my time my spare time playing basketball that's simple but my teacher would like for me or has asked me to write a compound sentence so I could do something very quickly like this comma and comma and divides two independent clauses. And I understand the confusion that you can create a list. Let's see, let's get my font back together. Comma and can be used in a list of three items or more. Very simple. We've known that since elementary school, that that's how comma and works. Comma and can also be used one other way. Only one other way. Comma and. I spent most of my spare time playing basketball. That's a complete independent clause. Subject verb. I spent something. The end. That's independent. On the other side of comma and, we have the pandemic ended my basketball season early, period. The pandemic, the subject, the pandemic ended, verb, something. Subject, verb, complement. The pandemic ended something, period, the end. That can stand on its own. So on both sides of this comma and, I have an independent clause, comma and, can be replaced with a semicolon, generally speaking. They are pretty much the same thing. However, a semicolon would not make sense here. It doesn't work that way. It's not the, it's not the same kind. A semicolon, just like this kind of comma and, has to have an independent clause on both sides for it to work. 
a semicolon can be used in a list, but it has to be a really complicated list. And that type of list is in your PowerPoint. So you can, you can find that. But generally speaking, we're not often going to use a complicated list in our writing. It's not going to happen very often. We're not going to see it written very often. However, in this case, with an independent clause on both sides, we can use a semicolon. And that's correct. I spent most of my spare time playing basketball. The pandemic ended my basketball season early. That is grammatically correct. It doesn't make very much sense in context though. It could sound a little bit better. There could be a better transition between I spent most of my time playing basketball and the pandemic ended my season early. There could be a clearer connection. And that could be as simple as comma but. When using comma but or any fanboys conjunction, which can be found in your PowerPoint, there has to be an independent clause on both sides. Comma, fanboys conjunction. Independent clause, comma, fanboys conjunction, independent clause. We can also connect these two ideas by making it complex. We can say, I spent most of my spare time playing basketball, even though the pandemic ended my basketball season early. That sentence is now complex. It can be flipped backwards so you can see it more clearly. So where the subordinate clause is, we can say, even though the pandemic even though the pandemic ended my basketball season early, comma, I spent most of my spare time playing basketball. That's a complete complex sentence. And it looks pretty good. So right now, even just from the beginning, I love basketball, simple sentence. And now we've got a complex sentence. I love basketball, even though the pandemic ended my basketball season early, I spent most of my spare time playing basketball. That is clearer, stronger writing already. You've only written two sentences. So I've got a simple, now I've got a complex, and it sounds really good. I still need a compound and a compound complex to make my writing as strong as my teacher wants it to be. I miss playing basketball with my teammates. I have the best time with them. We can approach this um, a few different ways. Actually, there's infinite ways to approach this. So I'm looking for a compound sentence so I can do a semicolon, and it would make perfect sense. I miss playing basketball with my teammates. I have the best time with them. A semicolon works and it reaches the objective. I've got simple, complex, and compound. The only thing I, I have left is compound complex. One thing I can do here too is I can say, I can connect the two ideas together with because. Because is a subordinating conjunction. Therefore, it makes this sentence complex. I can start this off backwards, right? I can say, because I have the best time with them, comma, I miss playing basketball with my teammates. I can do that, but I already have a complex sentence there just before it. I don't want to mimic or mirror or copy that structure again because my reader just saw me do that. So I need to do something different. I need to vary it. And for that very reason, I'm going to go ahead and say semicolon, simple, complex, here we have our compound sentence with a semicolon. It is the exact same thing as comma and, but the, the context of and there doesn't really connect my ideas the way that I want them to sound. I don't want to say it in addition to, I want to say it as an explanation. I want to say I miss playing basketball with my teammates. I have the best time with them. Here's an idea and here's its explanation and a semicolon does that very well. So just to, just to clarify, here's a simple sentence, here's a complex sentence, and here's a compound sentence. So to reach the objective in my rubric, right, this is a rubric, so here's the writing prompt with its rubric, right, the rubric is a scoring guide with numerical values. A rubric is a scoring guide. So that means your grade with numerical values. That means number values. Your number values within your grade, that's how I give you a grade, right? So maybe you have 100%, maybe you've got 16 out of 18. Those are numerical values when you see those. 10 points, 2 points, 2 points, those are numerical values. 
that's what allows me to give you a clear, fair, justified grade because you have to have a numerical value as your grade. If it were just, oh, well, this student is doing wonderful and improving and on par and on track with progression for that student, and I could be like, A, and, and, and move on from there, I absolutely would. But that's not the world that we live in. You have to have numerical values as your score. A lower score where you miss something is not an indicator that you're stupid. It's not an indicator that you're less than. It's an indicator of this is what you missed. This is what you need to work on. This is what you need to improve. It's a mark in time of your improvement. And that's it. So here's your scoring guide. So minimum, I'm going to ask you for, for typically five or ten sentences here. It's been ten. But we're still working on this paragraph down here, so we don't want to get too distracted. I have reached one, two, three sentences here. I need a minimum of five, and I know that I need a compound complex to continue or to finish my uh, objective. So I'm going to have to come up with some new idea. So I know that I need to add a compound complex sentence and then one more to reach the objective of five minimum, okay? I've got a simple, a complex, and a compound. I need a compound complex to reach the objective and then one more additional sentence to reach that objective, to reach that minimum. So instead of having spent about five minutes on this paragraph, I'm going to have to spend even more time on this paragraph. I'm going to have to be even more conscientious and conscious of what I'm saying and what I'm writing and add a little bit more to it than I, I previously did when I wrote my first draft. Even though my first draft was okay and was a good place to start, it wasn't enough and it wasn't strong enough. My writing needs to be better, so I have to put forth even more effort into what I'm saying. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take the time for a second to think about what else I could say and exactly how I can approach that to reach the, the fourth objective, the fourth sentence type. Okay, so I took some extra time to write a fourth sentence, a compound complex sentence. So it can always be changed, it can always be better, almost always. So for my compound complex, I wrote, I can't wait to play a normal basketball season again. That can stand on its own, that's independent. So that's my first independent of my compound part. And I am practicing as often as I can. That can stand on its own. So that's my second independent of my compound part. To have a compound sentence, I need two independent clauses. I can't wait to play a normal basketball season again. I am practicing as often as I can. That is compound. My subordinate clause, my subordinating conjunction is because. Therefore, my subordinate clause is because I want to be ready for the next season. The bare minimum of a complex sentence is that I have a subordinate clause and one independent. I've got two independent to make it compound and a subordinate clause in order to make it complex. So I have reached the objective of doing all four sentence types in this paragraph right here. And I only have four sentences. Well, in this pretend scenario, my teacher told me to have five. So I'm gonna write one more sentence and then my paragraph will be done. So I often have students writing final sentences like uh, the one I've written here. The very first thing I would do if I, if I saw this in a paragraph and as I have while grading your papers, I would draw a line through this and then I would write redundant, is what I would say. I would say uh, redundant, which means you've already said it. If I were reading this as a student, I, I would point out, I spent most of my spare time playing basketball. You've already told me uh, at that point what you've done with your spare time. So I don't need a sentence to tell me what you just told me. It's, it's redundant, it's repetitive. 
And basically, you're kind of telling me as a reader that I kind of need help reading what you've written. So we don't want to do that. We don't want a placeholder like that. We don't want redundant sentences. We want to keep adding and adding and adding to what we're writing. We don't want any space to be wasted. So a better sentence would be, something like this. Um, I know that practicing can only make me a better player for my team. And of course, if you love your team and you want to work for your team, you want to be the best team player you can be. Um, and in this pretend scenario, that's exactly what this student is trying to explain. I love basketball. And so next what they've said is, let me explain to you how much I love basketball and what I think about it. Even though the pandemic ended my basketball season early, I spent most of my spare time playing basketball, which implies that this student played basketball when they didn't even have to. They weren't even required to practice or be at practice. They just chose to do so because they love basketball. I miss playing basketball with my teammates. I have the best time with them. That just further solidifies how much and why the student loves basketball. They love their teammates. Why do they love their teammates? They have the best time with them. I can't wait to play a normal basketball season again. Logical, makes sense. And I am practicing as often as I can because I want to be ready for the next season. Why do I want to be ready for the next season? Because I want to be a better player for my team. And I know that practicing can only make me better for my team. So that's the logical progression of ideas there. It's a very strong piece of writing for a quick five sentence paragraph. And that's what we're going for. I don't want you to just sit down and just list a bunch of things without really thinking about it or spend a very brief amount of time writing a paragraph you've probably already written a thousand times over in your elementary and middle school career. I want you to really spend time with your writing consciously and conscientiously placing commas and semicolon and independent clauses and subordinate clauses and logically progressing through your ideas and your thoughts and really explaining yourself instead of leaving it, everything up to the reader to decide. That's what we're reaching for over and over and over because it builds a better foundation for the rest of your academic career and it helps you keep thinking about all of the things you're going to be questioned about on the SAT. If you know how to write this paragraph, then you know how to answer most of the grammar questions on your SAT already or at least you have a very good place to start to make a really strong guess. So that's how you reach the objective of four sentence types and that's why we're emphasizing it so much. The reason I pulled this rubric up specifically is because it's your remote Wednesday two. So it's your second remote Wednesday. Um, initially I, I wrote week two remote homework because I didn't really know how to title that and designate it right in live grades to make it very clear as to what I was talking about. So it could be more clearly written as remote Wednesday two, which is uh, hopefully what I wrote it as um, or named it in live grades. And then you've got your standards up there. Um, I should go ahead and note that utilizing a semicolon is a specific standard included amongst those for ninth graders. So that's part of your, your sentence types emphasis there. Because if you know how to use a semicolon, you know how to identify an independent clause and a, and a subordinate clause. Just to clarify, I've put that up on the screen. We know that an independent clause needs a subject and a verb. That's all it needs for it to be complete. And then we've got a subordinate clause. This is necessary for a complex sentence. Subordinate is just a fancy word for saying dependent. But when we talk about subordinate clauses, we have to talk about subordinating conjunctions. And it's significantly easier to talk about a subordinate clause in relation to a subordinating conjunction. Okay, so for a subordinate clause, you have to have a subject and a verb, just like above here. But what you also need is something to kind of disrupt it and make it independent. You need a subordinating conjunction. A subordinating conjunction, for example, would be even though, because. It could be while, although. In order to use a semicolon, you have to be able to identify this 
and differentiate it from this. The reason I have this specific remote Wednesday 2 writing prompt up here is because it's going to be counted towards your grade twice. Once as a normal assignment and once as your nine weeks test. So whatever score you get on the assignment, that's the score for your test too. The reason why I chose this as your nine weeks test is because I feel like this one combines pretty much every discussion we've had in person. At this point in time, we've only met seven times total and we've discussed positive and negative tone, sentence types, basic grammar. We have a little bit of test prep in there because I've already discussed the, the connection between what you're writing and your SAT. And I also wanted to break down how a rubric works. So like I, like I said before, a rubric is a scoring guide with numerical values. These are your numerical values. What I've started off with is 10 complete sentences minimum. So regardless of what you are saying, that line has to be drawn because this, having 10 complete sentences minimum forces you to think about what you are writing. It forces you to be conscientious and conscious of what you are saying and your intentions. So that's 10 points. That is a minimum standard. So if I see that you've written about seven or less, then I've probably given you a zero, or I probably will if I have yet to grade it, because that's a minimum. And at that point, if you haven't given me the minimum requirement, then I don't see it as fair for me to give you the minimum requirement. If you haven't even given me the minimum effort to complete the assignment in full, or at least attempt it in full, then I don't see it as fair for me to have to spend the time checking off every little mark and giving you that much feedback for something that you didn't place the minimal amount of effort in. So if it's seven, about seven or less, then I'm gonna stop there. If there's a ton of incomplete sentences, run on sentences, then I might also stop there. Because if I'm seeing that, then there's no way that you've met the four types. There's no way that you've met the 10 minimum. And at that point, if you're writing sentences that are not complete, sentences that are run ons after run on after run on, the bat is a foundational issue that we need to address quickly before moving on to any other expectation. We need at least the minimum effort and at least know what a complete sentence is. We have to, that issue needs to be addressed immediately. I also have my PowerPoint up here, the one that kind of creates your notes. I have that up here because I, I kind of just wanted it on screen in case I needed it. Um, this is just one slide, but it could very well be the most important slide. If you don't have this minimum in your notes, then you have very likely struggled with every single assignment that you've been given in this class. And I also wanted it on screen because I wanted to emphasize that these are the rules to play by and these rules won't change. So if you've ever played a video game or any type of game in general, you know that you have to play by the rules in order to play the game at all. And if you're really good at playing that game, then you know that you have to use the rules and the limitations and restrictions of the rules to your advantage to be the best you can be. And that's exactly what this is. What's outlined in your PowerPoints and your notes, these are the rules of the game. Those rules won't change and you have to use them in order to succeed in this class. Another point of emphasis that I've repeated to students in the past is that a way of looking at it is this. You cannot decide that the content of this class does not matter, but your grade does. They are exclusive to each other. You have to care about the content and practice the content, practice the rules, understand the rules, understand the value of them, how important it is to keep your notes, if you're gonna place importance in your grade. So if we're gonna stress about our grade, if we're gonna be emotionally attached to our grade, which I completely understand, and is completely reasonable. If we're gonna place that much importance in our grade, then we have to place the exact same amount of importance in the rules of that class and the rules of those assignments. And that's exactly why I have this up here. When I go through and I look at your writing, more often than not, there is a rubric like this. There is a scoring guide like this that I am following. And it may not always be written out like this. It may just be written out simply Barrier sentence structure, use all four sentence types, so many complete sentences. 
and there's usually not these smaller objectives in there. That's why I chose this as your nine weeks test. That's why this is so important is it has those smaller objectives, a semicolon, contractions, which you write with all the time. Why did I choose to give you points for correct, appropriate contractions? Well, because we often get things like your and their and we're, and it's um, confused. So I want you to be conscious about the choices you're making in your writing when it comes to those contractions. And I want you to use your apostrophe. If you don't use your apostrophe there in your contractions, they don't count because you need to be conscious and intentional about your writing. Same thing with the possessive apostrophe. We get those confused all the time. So at that point in time, I need you to be very conscious of the rules. I need you to go back through the PowerPoint. It's at the end of the PowerPoint. Find those rules. Find any resource online that you can find. Find it in your note how to do that. Your apostrophe has to be clear. It has to be there. It has to be correct and appropriate for what you're saying, for the number of people you're addressing. And then you need to have your all of your sentence types. And in doing so, usually to get compound as opposed to compound complex, you need a semicolon to do that. You need to know how that works. It's, it's, not, um, it's not a big mystery as to how a semicolon works. And it shouldn't be a mystery your whole life. It should stop being a mystery now. Independent clauses won't change. They are what they are. Subordinate clauses won't change. They are what they are. The rules of the game are not changing. So we need to just accept how important they are and continue to use our notes and use our, our PowerPoints over and over and over and over again until we know the rules forwards and backwards without referencing anything. Because when you take the SAT or the PSAT, you, you can't reference anything. You need to know them. You need to know the rules. And one last thing I want to say before I end the video is that I think some things are coming up here and there that you've sent to me in live grade and I've missed it. So just kind of imagine for a moment that you as a student, you've sent me probably 5, 10, maybe 15, 20 messages through live grades just as a student yourself. You have the option of three attachments per message. So you can kind of imagine and do the, the math there as to how many attachments that could be for me in live grades times most of the students that I have. For me to go back through all of those attachments and re-download them time and time again, trying to, trying to locate one single assignment takes quite a lot of time. And I'm fine with doing that. I'm not against doing that. However, the reality of it is that it takes a ton of time to do that. Because the attachments usually aren't typically, they're typically not labeled. And I understand that completely because it takes a lot of time to label those attachments the ways that we are sending them, the ways that we know how to send them. There really isn't a much better way. A much better way would take much more time. So kind of my message to everyone is that if we could just be patient and understanding that perhaps if, if I have missed an attachment, then it might be best for you to just kind of go find the attachment and send it to me again. So that way I have it up front. I don't have to look for it. I can just go ahead and grade it and, and so we don't have to worry about it anymore. But the response to that is often, well, I've deleted it. Well, even if you've deleted something, all it's done is just, it's just moved to another folder. It's not actually gone. You can't actually, uh, you cannot actually permanently delete anything from live grades. Everything is there. Once, once it's there, it stays there um, for a set amount of time, like, uh, a year, a few years, I'm not really sure, but it doesn't really actually ever go away. It's always there. So you have in your messages, you have like a compose tab and that's how you send messages and make them. You have a sent folder and that's everything you've sent to your teachers. Everything and anything you've sent to your teachers is still there. So all you have to do is find it in that folder. Um, let's say perhaps I have sent you something and you've deleted it. It's just in a deleted folder. It's usually it's probably trash or recycle or whatever. It doesn't really ever go away. And so I've said if you have sent me something and I've missed it, uh, look in your sent folder in live grades and you can send it. That will push it to the front, to the top of my inbox, and I'll see it. Absolutely. I, I can find it very quickly. Everything you sent to me through live grades and your other teachers, it, it's still there. It does not go away. It would take me exponentially longer to find your assignment out of hundreds of messages than it would for you to find one out of your own sent folder. So you, you are only managing you. 
but I'm on the other side of live grades managing over 100 students and hundreds and hundreds of mess. So it, it takes quite a while to go back and find specific items. And that's not an excuse. That's not saying I'm, I'm refusing to do that. That's not saying that it's ridiculous for me to do so. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that the reality of it is that it takes an exponential amount of time. If I've missed it, please resend it. It takes a long time to find it. It would take you maybe a few minutes to find it. It could take me even longer to find it. So we could save time by just putting it at the top of, of my inbox to answer. Um, no messages are ever actually deleted from LiveGrade. So don't, don't ever assume that something is gone. Um, it's probably just that you're not looking in the right folder. So anyway, I hope that this message helps. I understand that I did not Zoom this week, if we go into remote learning based on Saturday's map, obviously we will Zoom on a regular schedule. Any parent phone calls, grading will just have to happen between and after the Zoom. 